welcome to our Otter Talk today. Our speaker is Ray Sentner from University of South Florida, and he is going to tell us about pseudo inverses in the hardy space of the polydisc. Okay, so thank you, Meredith, for inviting me to give this talk. This is a subject I am interested in, so I chose this topic, pseudo inverses in the hardy space of the polydisc, primarily for two reasons. Uh, the first reason is it's, it's a subject area that I'm interested in looking into in further detail. So by having the opportunity to talk about it, it sort of jumpstarts that journey. Uh, the field's interesting. It lies in the interplay of signal processing, uh, functions of several complex variables, and also operator theory. And this, the second reason is because there is an open problem that I want to bring to attention. It's a, a problem that was posed back in the 70s um, in, in reference to uh, digital filter design. And it's something that got me interested in the field of signal processing. And so it's something I want to share with everyone because um, it doesn't seem like there has been much progress with this particular open problem. There has been attempts in the 80s, and I know even uh, in, Meredith and Alan Sola published or uh, posted a paper recently on the archive, which outlines this problem in, um, in detail. So um, it seems like something I think worth mentioning. So the, um, the outline of this talk, I want to first, the first half I want to talk about really this particular open problem, give a little bit of background of it in a, a more of an engineering context. In the second part, I want to talk about a, a technique that could possibly be used to uh, study this problem in more detail. This is the technique of using pseudo inverses to study these polynomials. And there has been work in this direction back in around 1985 in the context of the hardy space of the disk. Um, it's interesting to note that a lot of those ideas can be extended easily in the poly disk case. So I, I want to talk a, a little bit about that in the third section. So the second section, um, especially being familiar, um, giving this talk to a group of operator theorists, the section two will probably be um, a, a review of just basic concepts. But what's really interesting is how it's applied to the Hardy space. It, so that would be in section three. So in the first section of motivation, I, I'm going to be in general talking about functions of several variables, several complex variables. So I do want to just come to terms with this multi-index notation that I'll be using. You know, multi-indices are these vectors over the, I'm taking them over the integers. Um, I'm choosing integers as opposed to the typical natural numbers, just so that I can talk about um, series with negative exponents on certain variables. But these collection of vectors will form a partially ordered set with this particular relation. Alpha is less than or equal to beta, provided that each respective component um, follows that relation. I have this idea of, I, I don't want to call it norm, but we'll, we'll say size of alpha, which is uh, computed by just summing each component. But uh, I, I, I do want to avoid, I, I like to avoid words like size or norm just because alpha in this context could possibly be negative. So uh, what do I mean? For so shorthand notation, if I take any complex, um, any d tuple in CD, what I mean by z to the alpha, I just take each component and I raise it to the respective component of the multi-index. The whole purpose of introducing this multi-index notation is just so that I can simplify expressions like this. If I have some ugly looking expression um, a function of three complex variables, z1, z2, z3, I can just rewrite it in a form that's a lot more presentable. So I'm going to use this notation to introduce the main object of study, and this is the hardy space of the polydisc. 
So the Hardy space is the collection of power series um, such that the coefficients are square summable. Now these, this space is complete with the following inner product, which just extends the usual inner product in the Hardy space of the disk. Okay, so for this motivation section, I'm going to be concerning myself with some type of engineering system in which relies on an input of several variables, X alpha. So our X alpha could be some type of quantity which depends on, uh, usually on time, but also it could be um, spatial dimensions, um, whether it's some kind of radial distance or um, possibly dependent on um, three spatial dimensions. But at any rate, I am having some kind of multivariable input. And so, so from an engineering perspective, I want to figure out how to manipulate that input in a way so that the output Y of alpha meets certain specifications given by the problem. So I, to facilitate this discussion, I want to make some assumptions on the input X, which will dictate some results later on. But nevertheless, I want to, um, in this case, assume that the input is zero anytime that the indices have at least one component that's negative. So I want to extend the idea of a causal sequence to this multivariable case. So if any of the indices are negative, I uh, take the input value to be zero. And for purposes of convergence, which I'll mention in the next slide, I want to assume that this input sequence is exponentially bounded, which in application is not at all restrictive since most of the sequences that are going to be considered would be bounded to begin with. But I do want to just at least impose that condition so that I can have some kind of sane argument or presentation when I talk about um, what's known as the Z transform. Uh, the output, I, so I'm going to consider these linear systems and so in which these output are represented by these finite difference equations. So I, I do want to consider systems that are recursive in the, so in the sense that a particular Y alpha uh, clearly depends on the input X at uh, several points, we'll say um, previous, but also um, this um, each Y alpha value could depend on previous output values. So in general, I have, if, as an example, maybe something that looks like this. And, but my ultimate goal, or at least a, a, a goal in this direction would be to um, figure out how to specify these coefficients so that our output meets certain conditions, certain specifications. And I want to do that in a way in which is not at all physically damaging to the system. And so I, my whole, the, this whole goal in this direction is to study this difference equation. So I, in order to study this difference equation, oftentimes this tool of Z transform is used. So it's this multidimensional Z transform. And be, um, before I give a definition of this, I do want to mention that they're um, depending on the literature, uh, the Z transform could be defined differently. And it, it, in, um, either way, it does not necessarily matter. I'll, I'll mention what I'm talking about in a moment. But for now, if I, I had this exponentially bounded sequence X alpha, um, I'm, so I'm defining the Z transform to be this power series where the alpha th component of the sequence is paired with the alpha th component of Z. And in, in that case, I, I made some crude assumptions on the original sequence, but uh, because I, at the very least I could, because of that, I can um, conclude that this power series is a meaningful expression in the sense that it converges in some poly disk. 
And so if you're looking through modern engineering literature, oftentimes you'll see Z transform defined as X alpha being compared with the minus alpha component of Z, which is totally fine. It, it just, if you're, I'm, I define it in this way so that it can be somewhat consistent with engineering literature from the seventies so that my statements about stability will be consistent. But um, I, that is something I just wanted to, to point out in case you're um, looking at some of the old literature, comparing it to some of the new literature. The, there's not uh, necessarily um, consistency with the definition of Z-transform. And if anyone knows why that is, I would be interested because I don't know. <laughs> but, it, but it are benefits to one way and not the other. But um, nevertheless, I define this power series and I can use this tool to study that difference equation. So um, I, via this property that if you have a sequence X alpha that's altered by some arbitrary multi-index beta, if you want to find the Z transform of that altered sequence, um, it's nothing more than the Z transform of X scaled by Z to the power of beta. And that's easy to show just by uh, the change of variables. Okay, so I use this property B. And so I start with this original difference equation and I apply this tool everywhere. And then I can collect the terms with the Z transform of Y. I can solve for it. And what I end up with is that the Z transform of Y equals the Z transform of X scaled by some rational function. So this rational function is told to, um, you know, quote unquote, filter the input and hence is given the name digital filter. So a digital filter in this context is just this rational function that relates the Z transform of the input with the Z transform of the output. And so from an engineering perspective, if I am concerned with some kind of filter design, I would want to somehow um, design this rational function, come up with a rational function so that it meets certain specifications, which the specifications are usually given in terms of its magnitude. Um, and really um, what happens on the, uh, the boundary of the poly disk. But I, I don't want to get into that. Um, th the purpose of this is just to motivate this idea of a digital filter and then see what um, this open problem is so that I can suggest um, an operator theoretic approach to this. So in designing these digital filters, though, um, there's a couple of things you have to consider. One, you want your filter to resemble what you're trying to have it do, but also you want to make sure that it, um, your output in, in turn doesn't become erratic um, when you subject it to some nice bounded input. So there's this phrase Bebo stability, which just means that if you're subjecting your system to an input that's bounded, you want to make sure that your output doesn't um, increase with time essentially, or um, uh, the amplitude doesn't increase with time. So you want to make sure that this digital filter um, preserves this property of Bebo stability. And that's, that, that, so that was a, that's a big problem even right now, uh, an active area of research in, especially in two-dimensional digital filtering. Coming up with some kind of nice uh, a filter that does what you want it to do in a sense that it still preserves this property. Um, sorry, can you go one slide back yes. for the definition of the filter? Uh, a slide back. Oh, sure. Um, okay, yeah, here. Okay, thank you. That's, uh, yeah, I was wondering what the definition is. Okay, yeah. Um, so you, 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 you always, you're, I'm always studying these difference equations, these y alpha um, equals some expression, and then I'm, uh, converting it over uh, via this Z transform. And so I'm converting everything into um, in the, into functions of complex variables. And that um, because of property B, you can rewrite it 
um, you can, in this case, easily solve for the Z transform of Y, which allows you to relate it to the Z transform of its input through this rational function. Yeah. Um, and on the next slide, uh, the constant, the bounds that we have, are they uniform in alpha or are they specific for each? Yeah, uh, so you just wanna ensure that, um, your, so your input is always usually gonna be something that's bounded uh, regardless. And so that the output, you wanna make sure that it's, um, bounds the sequence regardless of how uh, time varies. Usually, so we're we're considering as the this, this size of this multi-index goes to infinity, but usually the only thing that's changing is gonna be the time at which you um, you consider the sample. So, as, as, so another, I think another um, way of saying it is as time increases, you just wanna make sure your output um, is just somewhat controllable. Oh, okay. Just uh, one more thing that alpha, it's a, it's a multi-index. So what does it represent? And does it represent space or time or something? Yeah, like so typically, so a lot of times the two-dimensional digital filtering uh, methods are used in uh, geophysic, uh, geophysical studies where you have um, a bunch of sensors that are positioned um, from some reference point and your input is going to be something that depends on the distance from that reference point, some radial distance, we'll, we'll say, and then just time. So oftentimes these problems are, a typical example is that you'll see in the literature will be in two-dimensional processing. Okay, got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So usually, um, I would say it's. Uh, you'd have to. Th I mean, you'd have to think about. Um, I, I can imagine that most of these, most of the context would be at most uh, four dimensional. Um, you know, depending on how you want to look at the spatial dimensions. Yes. Okay, I have a question as well, which is, so if you're just restricting to Z, which is like on the unit circle like each zj is on the unit circle i mean this like this is somehow like a fourier series right uh in so several variables you can think of it that way yeah. um are you talking about the z transform right and like the fact that you're multiplying by it right that would mean that you're that it corresponds to doing some kind of convolution on of a function on on z to the z to the d right yeah, so if, even in, so in the single variable case, uh, in order to solve these difference equations, once when you have the Z transform and you, um, you do your multiplication, you can just do a convolution to solve for your Y of alpha. Yeah, so then it seems like the boundedness, like if you're convolving with something which is like an L1 function on Z to the D, then wouldn't that mean that the convolution would map L infinity to L infinity? So it would be would be bounded. Is that is that a good intuition for this Bebo thing? Or do you want to That's, uh, think about it in a different way? So, so your question is, okay, so how could our input um, what would be a good example of an input which would um, correspond to um, your output? I mean, you can think of, you, you can take, you can take tri uh, trivial examples in which your input is say something on the, uh, we'll say your input maybe is something on the boundary of the circle or the boundary of the disc. And then, um, your output in turn will just be y of n, we'll say if we're doing it in single variables, y of n equals n. Now you can come up with, um, you'd have to experiment a little bit, but try coming up, um, I, I think if you choose x of n to be something like e to the i n or something like that, you could, um, I'd have to think of the exact example, but you, you can, um, in, you can show that the output in a case like that would be um, just N. Mm -hmm. 
and in that case, you would not have your boundedness because we would be our only variable would be considering is uh, time, which would be n. So, so I guess the so my question so like your rational function h of z, like where would its poles be? Yeah, no, that's a that's the and like would like so I feel like if the coefficients of the h of z are absolutely summable, that's like a sort of thing that automatically would give you boundedness. But yeah. That, that's um, but I guess yeah. you're trying to some, study something more subtle than that. Yeah, so you, um, the thing is, the specifications in the engineering problem will be given as a magnitude of your rational function. So you, um, so you, what you, the, your whole process would be is I want to find a rational function whose magnitude um, does something. And so the first problem is, creating that rational function but then you don't you have to look at the poles of the rational function if you have um the poles of the rational function are what's going to dictate whether or not your output is stable or it was your output has this uh bebo stability okay i see so i guess like my i guess what i was thinking with fourier transform would correspond to somehow where you have like the negative like the the What, like somehow like this, no. okay, I don't know. Maybe I'll ask, ask this later. But that's the, that's the, that's the essence of it. You, um, or that the big problem is um, ha having some kind of control where the poles of your rational function are. Because if you, your rational function may approximate the in absolute value, um, the rational function that's given in the particular problem. But the issue is your, um, you may have poles in a location which would um, force your output to act erratically. And that, that's the, that's, so that's the next theorem that I wanna mention. And that, that's tied exactly to the open problem that I wanna talk about. Um, <clears throat> so in, 1973, Justice and Shanks made this claim. So in um, a digital filter in D dimensions, um, you can, it, it's sufficient, or if you can guarantee that the rational function has no poles in the closed, by, uh, closed poly disk, then your rational function would correspond to a system that's stable. Okay, so there, um, that doesn't tell us how to design the rational function at all, but at least, at the very least, it says if our rational function has no poles in this uh, closed poly disk, then we're, um, at the very least, uh, we won't have this situation where we could possibly cause damage physically to the system. So this was, um, so as I briefly mentioned before, this was, this is, these, these, Considerations are usually in the two-dimensional case where your variables are um, time in some type of like radial distance. And uh, in 1972, Justice Shanks and Tradle suggested using what they referred to as planar least squares inverse polynomials in order to achieve this stability. So they proved that the, the these rational functions are, correspond to a stable system provided it has no poles in the closed poly disk. And the way they're going to go about that is to use these uh, PLSI polynomials. So, um, for, so first of all, what is a PLSI polynomial? So um, to come to terms with that, this is in reference to, we're given an arbitrary function F. So uh, not identically zero. But we have the, and you, so usually this function, you would think of it as possibly the denominator of the rational function. But at any rate, we start with the function f and some specified n. And so the PLSI polynomial in reference to that function f and that number n is the unique polynomial qn, which minimizes this norm. So, um, QNF is the projection of the orthogonal projection of one onto the finite dimensional space FPN. And uh, so PN is the collection of polynomials at degree at most N. And 
I, I made a comment that there's several ways of defining degree of polynomials in this multivariable context. And uh, Meredith and Alan Sola have a paper that explains this into more detail. And they talk about uh, benefit, uh, among other things, the benefit of um, defining the degree in a certain way, it, you, you know, maybe using a lexicographic ordering as opposed to a, a total ordering, for example. But this is, um, this is what they refer to as PLSI polynomials. In the mathematics community, you'll often see the phrase um, optimal approximants or maybe optimal polynomial approximants, um, OPAs. That's what I call it. But in trying to talk about engineering, I typically stay with the, this acronym. And if I'm in a mathematic context, I'll call them OPAs. But essentially, they're the same thing. In the, in the by disk, you'll uh, see the phrase planar um, to indicate that. In a general context, um, these, were, uh, these were originally studied in, we'll say, in the 60s in, in reference to uh, geophysical problems. They were, in general, considered as, um, in, in the space of L2 sequences, as um, least squares approximate inverses. So if you're, lo if you're looking through the literature, they, they do call these polynomials or these sequences uh, different things. But okay, so just to backtrack, we have we have a rational function. It, it kind of represents our, our system. We want it to be stable. So we want it to have no poles inside the closed poly disk. Um, we're going to somehow use PLSI polynomials um, to achieve that. Well, at least that's what was suggested. And the reason why they suggested it was because in, in 1972, they said they made this following conjecture. They said that for any polynomial, it's associated inverse. This PLSI is zero free in the closed disk. So they suggested that this was zero free. And so uh, therefore it would it possibly be used in terms of this filtered design. And the problem is it's <laughs> the problem is it's not true. So in a couple of years later, Guinan and Camp discovered a polynomial. Their polynomial had zeros in the open by disk, but the, the main point was that their associated PLSI polynomial had zeros as well in the open by disk, which was um, an issue. It can be an issue, at least at the very least, it disproves this conjecture. And they even took it a step further two years later and developed a method to construct polynomials in which the associated PLSI polynomial has zeros in the open by disk. So not only did, did they just, you know, they didn't just get lucky and find a counterexample, they developed a method to construct counterexamples. So at this point, it wasn't clear whether or not you can somehow impose conditions on the original function f so that you can guarantee that the PLSI polynomial is zero free in the closed disk. So I, I wanna somehow find, or at least at the time, the, the goal was to find sufficient conditions to guarantee zero free property. And uh, in the eighties, Del Sar, Guinan and Camp made this following conjecture. They stated that if you assume that the original function F which in their case was a polynomial. But if that original polynomial does not vanish at all on the closed by disk, then you can conclude that the PLSI polynomial is zero free in the closed disk. And there has been um, attempts since eighties um, to prove this and it is still to this day unsolved. And so that when I when I read that 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 motivated me at least to consider these areas of math. I, I got more interested in functions of several complex variables, in um, signal processing. Um, how, um, however, it's um, there's also been suggestions that instead of taking a more a complex approach to solving this problem, perhaps a more abstract approach is a way to go. And um, 
one reason to motivate that thought is that in 1985, um, a mathematician named Izumino um, used these pseudo inverses to study these types of problems. Uh, and then not problems about zeros, but use it to study these uh, least squares inverse polynomials. And in fact, a lot of some of the results in that um, field are actually really easy to prove using this framework of um, pseudo inverses. So, so this, this is motivating me to now start to study things like you know, Toplitz operators on these spaces and try to get um, see how this relates to um, these rational functions. And so what I wanna do in the next section is talk about a, a, a tool um, of pseudo inverses. And I just wanna introduce um, the notion of pseudo inverses, but the, the whole purpose of then I wanna show how it applies in the case of the Hardy space. So in, in doing this abstraction, I'm considering, I, I just want to now just consider two arbitrary Hilbert spaces, H and K, and I want to consider any closed range operator, um, li bounded linear operator from H to K. Well, uh, I going, I'm, what I want to do is I want to decompose these spaces H and K. I want to decompose H in the following way. Um, the kernel of A, th that's a closed subspace. Um, also, it's orthogonal complement, which I'm calling X is closed subspace that collectively give us H. So I just want to decompose H as the direct sum of X and Z. And now I am imposing the condition that A has a closed range. So I can use that to decompose K in a similar fashion. Um, we know the range of A is closed. It's orthogonal complement is always closed. And again, they give us the entire space K. So I can, just like I did with H, decompose K as R plus H, I'm sorry, R plus Y. And so I want to define an operator um, by, uh, by viewing H and K in that following fashion. And I want to do so uh, according to this rule. So I want to define an operator from K to H, um, which does the following. To any arbitrary element in K, well, we know we can write it as something from the range of A plus something from its orthogonal complement. So it could be written as um, A of some something from h which in turn i'm writing that particular h value as something from x plus something from z and then um now um something from the range plus something from the orthogonal complement and what i'm def what's i'm defining t to be is just the map which takes that expression and sends it to that particular x um, it, it's easy to show that this is well defined, and also knowing that the original function, the original operator A, is bounded, um, it follows um, follows that it has a closed graph, which um, you can conclude from that point that the operator T is is bounded itself. So T is a bounded linear operator from K to H, and it, it satisfies some properties. The first property is. Um, you, you can check, it's, um, it's straightforward to check that T times A is Hermitian. Also, A times T is Hermitian. You can uh, show that TAT equals T. And the other way around, you can show that ATA equals A. And these properties are interesting, um, for one, because it turns out that there's only one bounded linear operator from K to H that satisfies those four properties. So at the very least, that's that in itself is interesting. So for that, um, this operator T is going to be called the pseudo inverse of A. So the operator from that, um, which satisfies those four properties in reference to A is the pseudo inverse of A and denoted by A dagger which um, oftentimes is, is called a more Penrose inverse of A. And accordingly, those four properties are the more Penrose properties. 
um, well, it, it's called pseudo inverse. Um, the operator A does not need to be injective, but for example, if it was bijective, then you can conclude that the inverse and the pseudo inverse are the same thing. Uh, interesting properties, which are an interesting property that is going to be used to connect this idea to the PLSI polynomials is this following proposition. If you have arbitrary Hilbert spaces H and K, and you have this closed range operator going from H to K, uh, bounded linear operator from H to K, um, if you want, uh, for any given Y in the space K, if you're looking to find the distance from Y to the range of A, the particular X or A particular X value that does that is the image of Y under the pseudo inverse of A. And, and there's no reason to believe that there should be just one solution to this problem. Um, it depends on the operator A, but uh, in the case where you have multiple solutions, multiple values of X that minimize this norm. Um, it's interesting to note that the image of Y under the pseudo inverse has the smallest norm among all the others. Okay, so these were just pro these are properties of the pseudo inverse. So I want to now take these into the framework of the Hardy space. So I so I'm talking about mathematics now. So I want to use uh, terminology that's um, at, at the very least more familiar to a mathematics community, and that's OPAs, optimal polynomial approximants. Um, so it's the same idea of the planar least squares inverse polynomials. I mean, in this case, the only difference really is that it, well, first of all, it's in reference to the poly disk, but also it's for any arbitrary function, not just polynomials F. But the definition is the same. It's the nth OPA of one over F is the unique polynomial QN, which N is previously specified. Um, that minimizes this norm. So QNF is just the orthogonal projection of one onto the finite dimensional space, this FPN. Uh, and so I want to somehow introduce this idea of pseudo inverses into this context. So at some point, I'm going to be defining uh, Toplitz operators with an analytic symbol. So I want to introduce the space H infinity. And H infinity is just the collection of power series um, that are bounded in the uh, this poly disk. OK, so just for notation purposes, I, I'm going to let EN be the orthogonal projection from the Hardy space onto the polynomial space. Um, and for any H infinity function, I, I'm going to let TF be this Toplitz operator, this, um, this multiplication. Um, I take any arbitrary function G in the Hardy space, and if I multiply it by F, we're, we're still in the Hardy space. Okay, so this, this ties to optimal polynomial approximants in the following way. If um, recall that for optimal polynomial approximants, we're looking to minimize this norm that I have written on the left-hand side. Um, we know that the particular Q value that does so is little qn. Well, if you look at the norm on the right-hand side, uh, what we're trying to do there is we're trying to find the distance from one to the range of this operator TFEN. So from that uh, proposition on pseudo inverses, the um, G that does that is the image of one under the pseudo inverse of TFEN. And this is unique. Um, merely for the fact that the, uh, the range of this pseudo inverse lies in the polynomial space PN. 
but uniqueness also follows from the fact that uh, optimal polynomials are unique since they're just orthogonal projections of of one. Um, but at any rate, um, so our original goal, we're, we we want to learn about zeros of these QN, or at the very least, properties of QN. So um, it, 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 see, it seems reasonable at least to maybe focus our attention in, in more general context about uh, the op this pseudo inverse of TFEN, where F is the particular function that QN comes from. And so this was done, okay, so in the Hardy space of the disk, this was done in, or at least these types of considerations were, um, were done in, um, in the context in the context of the hardy space of the disk and so there are some results that are very easy to prove in this context so i, I do want to show one of those results and th this was shown in 1985 but the so it's not anything new but i i, I do want to show how this framework allows us to prove at least some statements pretty easily um, and then i'll do the same thing with the um, poly disk so um, before I do that, I do want to uh, mention two lemmas. So uh, the first lemma is we start with this H infinity function. Uh, well, if it's H infinity, we have, and we're talking about over the disk, we have this inner outer factorization. Um, I'm calling UF. And um, the first thing you can notice is that the pseudo inverse of T lowercase f e n is related to the pseudo inverse of T capital F E N through this equation. First of all, I was showing this isn't difficult. Um, you just look at the pseudo, uh, you look at the operator on the right hand side and you show that it verifies those four more Penrose properties from um, in reference to T little F E N. Um, but what's interesting about this is that now if we want to study the pseudo inverse in reference to lowercase f, we can now direct our attention to capital F, which capital F is outer. So um, in this context, it has nice properties. For example, it's cyclic. So if you want to show particular convergence results, you have the power of cyclicity to do so. And uh, the, the function u is an inner function, so it has a lot of nice properties. So we notice that in this case, the pseudo inverse of TF EN is given by the pseudo inverse of the uh, T capital F EN times the uh, this adjoint uh, TU. And we can go one step further and rewrite this adjoint um, through this lemma. And this is a, a very straightforward to show that uh, the adjoint TU is just this multiplication by U bar times the projection from L2 to H2. And so these two lemmas together make it um, prove the following result pretty easily, which uh, this was done in 85, for example, um, but it's, just, it's nice to see how this framework allows us to prove this very easily. And I'll, I'll show that in a minute, but the statement is if you, we, we start with this H infinity function, so we have this inner outer factorization. So in, with that, I'm gonna let little uh, lowercase qn denote the opa of lowercase f in capital qn denote the opa of uppercase f and you can um uh, consequently the lowercase q is related to capital q just through this constant so little qn equals um u evaluated at the origin conjugated times capital qn that, that result, it, so this is actually kind of an interesting result because if you want to show properties about zeros of OPAs, so you want to show that, for example, the zeros of the OPAs lie outside of the closed disk, you can assume without loss of generality that the function's outer, which is nice because outer functions then are cyclic. So you have, um, you can use whatever properties of cyclicity are inherited now by our function.
this is easy to show. Um, now it is at, at the very least because we know QN, little QN is just the image of one under this pseudo inverse T lowercase f E N. And now you can use the first lemma to replace the pseudo inverse as the adjoint of U multiplied by the pseudo inverse of T capital F E N. And the, the next lemma, we could get rid of the adjoint and write it, um, replace the adjoint with um, this multiplication by U bar times the orthogonal projection. And at this stage, it's just a matter of plugging things in. We're multiplying by U bar, that does uh, minimal. Um, the projection of U bar into H2, well, U is uh, assumed we have uh, an H2 function to begin with, U bar um, uh, gives us that our projection is just a point evaluation at the origin. And this, uh, we have the pseudo inverse, which is nothing more than a linear operator. So we can take this constant out. And then we're left with the constant times uh, the image of one under this pseudo inverse of T capital F E N, which we know from proposition 3.1, again, that that's just capital Q N. So I think this is a nice way of proving this result in function theory. Um, by using just merely properties of the pseudo inverse. And, and like the, the, the point of this necessarily is not necessarily this result, although it is an interesting result in some sense, um, but it's the fact that these, um, these generalized inverses are, uh, seem, to, might have an, might, uh, seem to have an advantage in this context. So I, I want to show another result like this in the poly disk which um, is even easier to prove. And then um, afterwards, I do wanna mention a few things um, of uh, future direction in this regard. But here's another example. Um, first, I just wanna prove this, or just show this lemma that uh, if you have this pseudo inverse of TFEN and you multiply it by the original operator TFEN, that's nothing more than the orthogonal projection of H2 onto FPN. And this follows, I, this, this is a more general result anyways. I mean, for any closed range operator A, A times its pseudo inverse is the orthogonal projection from the space K onto the range of A. But in, the, in this particular context, um, this is what that result just means this. And um, we're going to use that along with this. Uh, well, we're going to use that lemma to show this bound on the OPAs. So if I take any function in H infinity, which and now it, I'm assuming it's a polynomial, which doesn't vanish in the closed poly disk. So I want to mimic the condition of the weak Shanks conjecture. Um, then at, at the very least, I can say that the OPAs are all bounded by, well, they're, they're bounded in norm, but more than that, the, it's the norm, the soup norm of one over F. And whether or not this result is interesting, um, that's debatable, but the, I, I want to show it just because it's, uh, it's absolutely immediate from um, these properties of pseudo inverses. So for example, um, well, how would you prove this? QN is a polynomial in the space PN. So if, if, you, if you look at the first equation, if you apply EN to it, nothing happens. And if you multiply it by TF and then follow it by T of one over S, F, nothing happens. So that first equation is trivial. But what you can do is replace QN in that second um, equation by the image of one under the pseudo inverse of TFEN. And then notice that uh, present in this expression, we have TF, the pseudo inverse of TFEN multiplied by TFEN, which is the orthogonal projection now evaluated at the point one. So if you take the H2 norm of both sides, 
your bound is immediate. You you just see immediately that it's well the, the norm of the projection is just one, and the H two norm of one is one. So in that case, the H two norm of Q n is bounded by the operator norm of T of one over F, which is uh, just a soup norm of one over F. So you know again, um, this this the essence of this statement may not be that important, but it's at the very least it's easy to prove, and it gives at least some motivation into looking into these um, types of um, abstractions. So I, there's a couple of things I want to mention before I conclude. That um, so back so one of the reasons why I want to why I was giving this presentation is because I, at some point I want to look further into this. Um, I think it's an interesting field. So with that, um, I, to talk about weak Shanks conjecture, it, it seems natural to, if we're defining these Toplitz operators, then possibly to look at its spectrum because I, I, I want to know something about the range of this function f. And so it, it seems natural to talk about um, the spectrum of the associated Toplitz operator. So I, at, a, at a first starting point, then perhaps maybe I can ask questions about the spectral properties of this pseudo inverse. And a more, so more specifically, I will start with point spectra. And I, at, at the very least, I, I think the first question that I would ask is, you know, what is an eigenvector in this context? What does that mean? Um, so does this operator have eigenvectors? What do they mean in, in context of optimal approximants? Um, how does that, how do they, whether, how do those eigenvectors relate to the symbol F is an interesting question. And there's some, I mean, already you can say that if you assume that the function F is weakly inner, for example, weakly inner just meaning that F is orthogonal to polynomial multiples of itself, non-trivial polynomial multiples of itself, then the, the first thing you can say is, well, one is an eigenvector of this operator. The, the easiest function you can think of, one, is it an eigenvector? Well, uh, if you assume conditions on the, fun on the symbol, for example, if it's weakly inner, then you could say one's an eigenvector. That's follows, be, so what does that say in terms of optimal approximates? That just says the optimal polynomial approximate of a weakly inner function is constant. And that's a, that's a known result. And that's, that's a result that's, um, Meredith and Alan have that result uh, in their article, which I've listed in the reference. But um, in this context, that's all this is saying. That's all that is saying that it, one is an eigenvector of this associated operator, and I, I think that's interesting. So it'd be, I think it'd be fun to see um, to continue on, and you give an arbitrary function g and ask yourself what conditions I can impose on f to conclude that it's some kind of eigenvector, maybe. So the spectral properties in general, I think, are interesting to look at. I, maybe it leads to nothing, I don't know, but it's something I would probably start with. Um, the other thing is convergence of these operators. Um, um, so I wanna know what happens when you increase N. So for example, if you know some nice properties of the function F, if you have cyclicity, you can claim that the pseudo inverse TF EN multiplied by TF converges strongly to the identity on H2. And so in the case of weak Shanks conjecture, we, we assume that our function F was a polynomial that doesn't vanish on the closed by disk. And so those polynomials consequently are cyclic. So in that case, you have this convergence. But it would be interesting to see if uh, what other types of conditions um, we can impose on F and still get some kind of convergence, maybe in a different sense. But um, I, I think that there's interesting avenues in that regard. Um, and again, maybe that gets nowhere, but you know, at the very least, if you look at this result, this 
this example, if you, okay, so we have strong convergence. So we, we have that pointwise operator convergence. So in other words, if you just plug in one, you have that TF times the image of one under that operator converges to the function one in norm, which just means F times the OPA QN converges to one as you let N go to infinity. Uh, but it would be, uh, like I said, these, I think these, this is a starting point for me. I don't know if it's going to lead to anything, but I think it's an, at least an interesting avenue to take. Um, so with that, I, I, I have some references posted here. Uh, most of them are engineering papers, which give uh, a lot more, a lot more detail than what I gave, mostly in the context of the by disk. But um, there is a paper, um, like for example, one, two, the fifth paper by Justice and Shanks that talks more about um, stability in, um, in arbitrary dimensions. Um, the fourth paper by Izumino, is, I like that paper a lot, that basically talks about a lot of these results, not necessarily the results, but they talk about using generalized inverses in the case of the Hardy space of the disk. And this last paper by Meredith and Allen, um, introduce this problem and they talk about optimal approximates in a lot further detail in reference to um, defining a polynomial degree in a certain way. Um, it's, it's, so these are all papers worth looking at. Um, so I listed those for reference and that is everything that I wanted to talk about. So if you do have questions, uh, I'd be happy to, well, I guess we don't have a lot of time, but um, I'll still be around to answer any questions that you have.